Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to At Home with Hayley. Um, I can see that some of you are coming through. And if you could let me know that you can hear me loud and clear in the chat box before we get started. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I can see all of the people coming through now. Say hi in the chat box. We love to see your messages. Uh, let us know where you're dialing in from as well. That's great for us to know and understand and see how many different countries we're bringing together this morning with that home with Hayley. I'll give it a couple of uh, more seconds before we get started, just so that people can get through. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Loud and clear, morning Eka. Morning Felix, morning Miguel. Lots and lots of familiar names here, a few that I don't know as well. So hello and welcome. So this morning we are going to do a short market update and we do have an awesome guest for you as well. We've got Belgium coming through, we've got uh, Stockholm, we've got Geneva, we've got Australia. Uh, we've got lots and lots of countries coming through, brilliant. <laughs> Morning, morning, everyone. Right, okay, so everybody's on. Um, I'm gonna get started. Uh, we're going to jump into our update. Then we do have a very special guest for you this morning. I'll talk to you a little bit later on about what they're going to be covering. It is a very, oh, we've got the USA on as well. So hi, Tim. Um, that's the first, I think, California. Brilliant. Um, so we're going to get started. Um, we, I'm doing a little bit of a twist on the market update because we gave an in-depth market update last month. Um, not much has really changed since then. Um, we're still plodding along and I'm going to give you updates in terms of what I think is viable for you to understand in your business to, to help you understand what's going on in the market right now. Um, and uh, we'll take it from there. So I'm going to jump off camera. And we'll get started with this update. So key economic data for the UK property market. The dynamics of the housing market are really determined by the underlying economic performance of the UK. The most important economic metrics of the UK economy are GDP, unemployment rate, inflation and interest rates. So let's look at, look at a few of those. Take interest rates. What impact do lower interest rates have on the overall economy? Well, firstly, lower interest rates make it cheaper to borrow. This encourages spending and investment, which leads to higher demand and economic growth. In theory, low or lower interest rates will mean less people will save and therefore it encourages individuals, consumers to spend rather than hold on to their money. The fall in interest rates also means lower monthly mortgage payments, which overall leaves households with more disposable income and should in theory cause a rise in consumer spending. If lower interest rates cause a rise in aggregated uh, demand, so AD, then it will lead to an increase in, the, in real GDP, aka higher rate of economy growth and an increase in the inflation rate. Much of the developed world has experienced a low interest rate environment since 2009 as monetary authorities from around the globe cut interest rates to effectively zero to stimulate the econ economic growth and prevent deflation. Low interest rates benefit the borrowers at the expense of the lenders and savers, basically. So which one are you? <laughs> are you... Uh, just don't buy doodads is, <laughs> is very much what I would say. But the message is spend, spend, spend. We talked about uh, last month the additional savings each household made during COVID. And of course, uh, this will help again with consumers spending activity. So all good news for the economy overall. So what's the news with employment then? Or unemployment, should we say? So unemployment, during 2021, the unemployment rate in the UK is likely, oh. sorry, I think I've lost you all here. Can everybody hear me okay? I got cut off for a minute then. 
Brilliant, that's great, fantastic. Right, so I'll start with unemployment then. <laughs> um, so during 2021, the unemployment rate in the UK is expected to reach 5.6% compared to last year's figures at 4.5%. And unemployment is expected to reach its peak in 2022, where it's predicted to be at 5.9%. The UK had generally been falling since its peak in 2011, when it was a whopping 8.9%. But figures are a lot lower than originally anticipated or predicted this time last year. And confidence has grown that the furlough scheme and government health throughout this pandemic has done its job. All will hang on public behaviour and consumer spending activities over the next five to six months, when I believe we will have a better and more clearer picture on stepping out of the pandemic without the government's security blanket creating a full sense of security. How will the public and businesses stand on their own two feet? And that really is the question. According to the government's independent economic forecaster, Britain's economic growth is set to accelerate next year, that's 2022, at the fastest rate since 1948. While this is promising, it's a long road ahead. The further financial pressure on the Treasury due to the third lockdown and restrictions still in place here until June has meant that the government were forced to maintain support for businesses and households until autumn this year. The scale of these impacts are unprecedented. With the further borrowing that has been forecasted for next year, it will take Britain's borrowing to 600 billion. Not since 1958 has Britain's debt to GDP levels been so high. This will have an impact on households for many years to come. How big of an impact, time will tell. But everything is going in the right direction and many people, public, businesses, well, pretty much everyone in general, is just desiring to get back to some sort of norm normality. Deal with what's to come and get on with it. I kind of love that. It's the, how do I say this politely, S-H-I-T. When the S-H-I-T hits the fan, there's no point in picking up the shovel. It's too late for that. So pull cover and then start clearing out the mess. And that's very much what I can see going on right now. It's going to continue to be a tough market uh, to compete, especially for investors, certainly for the next three to four months. Because of the sheer demand and appalling lack of supply, it's crazy out there. So I thought it'd be a good idea to have a little update from part of our power team. So what's the word on our conveyance in solicitors? Well, it's we're as busy as ever, swamped was the words they used, and they don't anticipate it to slow down anytime soon, certainly through to June, um, with a slight drop June to September in, in cases being pushed through. Surveyor's feedback was again very similar, busy, 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 with a huge lack of supply of properties on the market currently, the demand is outstripping the current supply, aka it's a seller's market, as we spoke about uh, last month, it's the strongest seller's market um, in a decade. RICS, the Royal Institute of Charter Surveyors, uh, during the beginning of the pandemic, instructed valuers to apply a material change of circumstances to their reports, asking them to co comment and on market stability. These instructions are no longer in place and RICS are forecasting stability and a strong stable market long term or longer term. There is still a question mark, however, on the property prices reaching a peak and the bubble bursting and a market for the latter part of this year and into the first and second quarter of next. But again, as I said before, this, in my opinion, will not be dramatic. It will be a correction, not a crash. I'd be very surprised to see anything otherwise, but I don't have a crystal ball. Um, none of us do. Um, so without it, um, I can only give my opinion. And I still maintain any fall will be minimal and maximum of 11% fall. It will be a correction again, as I said, in my opinion, not a crash. I think key factors here uh, is no one actually knows. Um, we can watch what's happening and react quickly. So I say, keep your ear to the ground, watch the flow of the sales and lettings in your chosen areas of investment, monitor your portfolios, adapt and change with the times. 
I say this all the time, but it's true as the first day I ever said it. We can make money in any market. Waiting is not the game we are in. Think outside the box, change tack, revisit investments, ask yourself, what can I do to drive my business forward? Then ask yourself, am I prepared to do that? If the answer is yet, yes, go out there and make it happen. Lending has improved and confidence returned somewhat in, the, in that arena. While interest rates are lower and loan to value slightly higher in many cases, I don't know um, about you, but I've seen lending criteria get stricter and they are asking a lot more questions now. But there are lots of different types of lenders in the marketplace now, which is excellent. There are so many different ways to raise finance nowadays. So what's my focus right now? Well, my focus right now is really commercial to residential, serviced accommodation, and there's no secret there. <laughs> I say this all the time. But buying businesses and portfolios also, selling old stock that I purchased 10 plus years ago, um, that doesn't perform as well as other parts of my portfolio, and developing on properties I already own in the form of changing the purpose of that or extensions to increase my revenue. I have two seven bed HMOs going through um, in article four areas, uh, going through conveyancing at this moment in time, and a commercial building that I'm converting into 11, possibly 12 flats. I'm still very much out there and in the market buying. That being said, I do feel your frustration. Last year, I lost out on deals um, and had more investment opportunities than ever before in my 19 years in the business fall through last minute, sellers pulling out and deals just falling through at the last hurdle. It's been a terribly frustrating year for me and it's very much the message I'm hearing from many, many investors out there. But sometimes, you know, you can only have, you can have, I, I suppose, all the will in the world, but it, it just doesn't happen for you and that's okay. Pick yourself up, remember it's a marathon, not a race and get back on that horse. This is a game, it isn't easy and it most certainly isn't for the faint hearted. But boy God does it build character and skill. And I don't know about you, but regardless, um, regardless of the knocks, the rewards far outweigh the negatives. Learn to love the chase, it's the thrill of the game, and I, for one, love to play. So on that note, we have one of YFE's very own mentors and trainers, and today her topic of conversation will be to address the current challenges in this crazy marketplace and how to overcome them. This is a great topic, and I, for one, am very excited to welcome Miss Sharon Mashon to the webinar. So if all of you can uh, say hi, Sharon, are you there? Morning, Hayley. Morning. Right. We've already got lots of questions coming through in the chat box. We'll we address those a little bit later on. Um, but uh, do you want to tell the viewers who you are and uh, just in a brief description what you're going to be covering off with them today? Yeah, sure. OK, so hello, everybody. I'm Sharon Mashin. I will tell you a little bit about myself in, um, in a bit more detail. But just in summary, I've been investing since the early 2000s. And um, so I've experience of property investing and um, sourcing, currently um, property managing and also now helping fellow investors understand their property management responsibilities. So we are looking at helping other people understand their responsibilities through various resources and uh, training opportunities that we offer to people so yeah so Haley's asked me to talk about challenges in the marketplace today um, which was interesting topic um, I've been putting my thinking cap on all week and there's lots to cover so I hope you don't mind I do have some notes as well just to make sure that I don't miss any of the important points brilliant that's great right I'm going to hand it over to you and let you take it away do you have control of the slides okay there we go. There we go. Yes, I, I certainly do. So thanks, Hayley. 
Okay, so hi everybody, uh, welcome this morning. Um, let me just give you a little bit of background about me so you can understand my story, how I get started in property and therefore how I can help you. Um, I started my career on the graduate training scheme with United Utilities, which is a FTSE 100 company. Um, I worked my way up the management ladder and I ended up staying there nearly 20 years. That wasn't the plan at the time, but that's what happened. Um, most of my experience in the company was around strategy and regulation. Um, and with my last role there, being senior program manager responsible for delivering the price review. Now, this was fantastic experience for me, actually. And little did I realise how much that would help me in starting and running my own business and also dealing with all of the regulation and legislation that impacts us in the property industry as well. So I started investing in the early 2000s, as I mentioned earlier. You can see on screen here, this is Steve. He's my husband and business partner. Um, so we've been working together for quite some time. Back when we started, we didn't know anything about property investing. We hadn't heard of any training courses um, or any investment strategies. We just simply thought investing in property seemed like a good idea for our long term pension plan. So we just went out and bought stuff, really. Um, our first purchase was a typical rookie mistake. It was an off plan new build apartment, not something I recommend. And I'm sure you've heard many other people talk about it. We still have it today. It's always been occupied, so the cash flow is great. Um, the capital value aspect, the less said about that, the better. But as Hayley said, property is a marathon, not a sprint. And we've had that for 20 years now. And we're not looking to um, sell anytime soon as the cash flow is great. We then moved on to buying two bedroom terraces. Um, this was much better investment for us, um, but the process was still fairly gradual. I say we didn't really know about investing strategy, so we just simply saved up enough money for a deposit and went to a estate agent and bought some houses. We didn't really proactively um, pursue property investing until 2011. So um, you cast your mind back then, this was at the last world recession um, after the stock market and housing crash at that time. Steve was working in the car industry at that time and he was offered a voluntary redundancy package. It was just too good to refuse really, um, given that the car industry looked on the brink of collapse at that point. Um, we thought we'd just take the money and run and we will um, change our lives. Um, and it certainly did. So with that money, um, we decided that property investing was the way to go for us um, for a second time. This time, however, we realised that um, we couldn't just be buying property as we had been doing. The money just wouldn't go far enough to meet our investment goals. We realised we needed to fast track our learning. So we took the opportunity to take some professional property training and that really kickstarted what we were doing. Through this training, we learned about a low market value and momentum investing strategy, and that's what we started with. As I say, back in 2011, this was um, at the, the, the last housing crash, so the timing was really good for us. We had some money from Steve's redundancy package, and there were repossessed properties coming to the market at knockdown prices. So we were able to build our portfolio really quite quickly. Um, within about six months, um, a friend of ours saw what we were doing and um, saw the returns we were getting and was really interested and offered to go into a joint venture partnership with us, which we're still in today very successfully. And we weren't even looking for a business partner at the time. But, you know, you hear on all these courses about creative finance and tell everybody uh, what you're doing and you get some interest. It certainly was true for us. Um, so that really kick-started our property management business. We were buying so many properties so quickly, um, we now needed an agent to look after them. I was looking for local agents, um, and but I just wasn't really happy with the level of service that they were providing. So that led us to set up Fox Dog Properties, which is our property management business, which um, we are still running and developing and growing today. So at this point, we were buying houses at a really fast pace using the momentum investing strategy. So we would buy repossessed properties 
at that time, people leaving repossessed properties were, were um, quite distraught and upset by the situation. And in many cases, they damaged the property as they were leaving. So that gave us a great opportunity to refurbish them um, to force capital appreciation, which we could then refinance and move on to purchase the next property. At first, even though I was uh, working full time, uh, we did a lot of the um, refurbishment ourselves. So Steve um, has qualifications in engineering and with his 20 year experience in industry, had many of the skills to be able to do the refurbishment work himself. However, um, as we were buying more and more properties and we had several projects on the go, it simply wasn't feasible for him to work on them all at the same time. And so we quickly began outsourcing and taking on bigger projects. We were soon doing um, full back to brick refurbishments and you can see on the slide here, this was a really exciting project for us. Um, the house was in complete disrepair and um, we had to replace the subfloor, um, which was damaged by dry rot, rising damp. Um, we took the opportunity to remodel the inside of the house um, and there was lots of external work needed doing as well, wall tie replacement and pointing. So this was um, an interesting project and a really exciting time for us and a great learning experience. Together with my uh, corporate experience in programme management and then our, this refurbishment experience, we were soon offering an end-to-end -end service for other investors. So we would source properties, we would hold their hands through the conveyancing process, um, we would then manage the refurbishment for them and carry out their property management activities. So I've got dozens and dozens of these projects under my belt, um, have dealt with all sorts of different contractors, principal designers, um, I now understand CDM regulations in detail and have been dealing with JCT contracts, including unfortunately when things go wrong and you end up in dispute and having to talk about liquidated damages, but I guess that's a topic for a different presentation. Um, through various networking, um, I met somebody who then um, asked if I would like to help people from around the world build investment portfolios in the UK. Uh, I jumped at the chance and again, this was a fantastic opportunity for us. Steve's then, Steve and I spent a couple of years then helping literally hundreds of investors um, understand the northwest, which is where we're based, the northwest of England, and we would host people in our area. We would show them lots of inward investment going on in our area, our live projects, and they were particularly interested in HMOs as well. My own personal portfolio is mostly single let with some HMOs. As a property management company, we now specialise in uh, managing high-end HMO, excuse me, high-end HMOs for um, other property investors across the Northwest. So as I said, today Hayley has asked me for my thoughts on the challenges in the property market right now. Um, and I wanted to um, share with you my thoughts of challenges, but also to um, throw in some suggestions on how you might be able to deal with these challenges, as well as some opportunities as well. So hopefully um, this is a, more of an upbeat presentation than just focusing purely on the challenges. It's certainly been a very interesting year living through a global pandemic. And a pandemic is not something that has ever appeared in my strategic planning before. Um, it might appear in a SWOT analysis going forwards, but certainly took me by surprise this time last year. The market now is very different to when I started investing in the early 2000s and actually different again to when we started reinvesting in 2011. Then we were in a worldwide recession and the housing market was severely impacted and it was definitely a buyer's market back then. As I say, we had the opportunity to build our portfolio really quite quickly. This is in contrast to today's market, which remains really quite hot. Hayley mentioned a few of the key statistics in her update earlier. Now, for some people, this can be confusing. I do get a lot of investors saying to me, why is the housing market so competitive? Given, for example, that last year we saw many large businesses going into liquidation and last year saw the greatest number of redundancies in recent history. 
Together with the challenges of Brexit, the challenges of freedom of movement, the problems we've seen with supply um, of materials over borders over Christmas and recent months, then that led some commentators last year to predict a housing crash, if not stagnation or a dip. Um, but I'm with Haley on this. I'm not seeing a market crash in the current um, in the current climate. In fact, housing prices have continued to rise. I was on a webinar earlier this week with a mortgage broker who said he had um, seen a report from Barclays and they were forecasting house prices to rise over the next five years. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there won't be peaks and troughs in that period as well, but the general trend will be upwards. There are several factors driving house prices. The most basic of this is supply and demand. Uh, a quick little bit of research, I found that analysts have suggested that there need to be around 300,000 new homes built every year to meet demand. And records show that last year there were less than 200,000 new homes built. Yet this was the highest number on an annual basis for over a decade. So you can see the fundamental principle of there is more demand than supply still stands regardless of other economic factors. Uh, recent reports by portals such as Rightmove and Zoopla show that the number of properties coming to market is lower than historically, yet demand is higher than usual as well. Other factors driving demand is the government furlough scheme. I'm sure Hayley will have talked about this in previous updates, but this is essentially a government scheme whereby the government pays the majority of people's wages for people who are unable to work because their employer needs to remain closed. So this is primarily impacting um, the retail, hospitality and tourism sectors. This came in last March and was originally for three months, but has been extended again and again, and now looks to be in place until the end of September. What this has meant is that people have been uh, more financially viable than perhaps they might otherwise have been, and have therefore been able to continue to pay their rent and their mortgages. There are several government initiatives as well that is fueling demand. Um, Firstly, the residential element of stamp duty land tax was reduced from 2% to 0% um, last year um, on properties of a purchase price up to half a million pound. This was due to end in March this year, but there was a bit of an uproar in the industry. So this has been extended for a good few months and it will gradually return um, to pre-COVID levels uh, at a tapered level um, over the rest of this year. Now, even though the 3% surcharge for buy-to-let or second properties remained in place, um, uh, lots of people in the industry did see a surge in purchases as a result of this reduction in stamp duty. Another initiative pushing up house prices is the new government scheme of creating mortgages that only require a 5% deposit. Now, these are for residential purchases only, and it's not just for first time buyers as well. I don't think I think um, other people can apply for it as well. And the government will also underwrite the remaining 95 percent of the mortgage for high street lenders. So these are the big high street lenders, um, not necessarily some of the specialist lenders that operate in the buy to let market. Um, but, but this is an addition to existing government initiatives around help to buy and shared ownership. So these have only just become available, but they will be, again, um, creating additional demand for properties. So all these factors now mean that if you're using a sourcing agent or you're looking for properties yourself, there are obviously still deals out there. As Hayley says, you can make money in any market if you, know, if you uh, look hard enough and you know what you're doing, you've got the right support around you. And um, it just might take you a little bit longer to find those deals and to work a little bit harder to get them. Another challenge I'm hearing at the moment is about the conveyancing process. Hayley mentioned earlier that um, in her report that um, solicitors were swamped. I'm hearing exactly the same thing. Um, again, I was on a webinar this week. A mortgage broker was saying that he um, had clients that it was taking around six months to complete on purchases and the average purchase um, 
period now is 14 to 16 weeks. So if you are uh, looking to uh, purchase property or do flips, then you do need to um, be aware of these challenges and build these timescales into your plans. Um, another factor that seems to be a delay is the slow response time of lenders. Again, from what I've heard, this seems to be a combination of them having to work from home. Many people still haven't returned to the office, so they're maybe not at full capacity, but plus also the extra demand. So as we've seen, more people are coming to the market uh, as a result of various different government initiatives, and they are just simply busy as well. Um, one example, like one lender was taking 10 weeks to even come to a decision. Um, you know, if you've got a mortgage in principle that lasts a 90 days, um, people are at risk of those mortgages and principles running out. Um, again, my recommendation here would be, would be to actively manage your solicitor and your broker and just keep reminding them that you're still there and keep um, edging them along and making sure that they are pushing your case forwards. Um, so let's have a look. Oh, mortgages. We talked about so mortgages and conveyancing delays. Right. OK, so my recommendation for people who are serious about investing and to address some of these challenges that I've just outlined is get yourself investment ready. Put yourself ahead of the other armchair investors out there and make sure that you're first in the queue to snap up those deals when they do come across your desk or when you find them. So what do I mean by this? Well, first of all, be very clear on your investment strategy up front. And again, um, as the market changes and the environment changes, you might need to revisit your strategy. So do make sure that you understand your current strategy, that it meets your current uh, goals and objectives and fits with the current environment. When you do spot a potential deal, you'll be able to assess whether or not it meets your long term objectives much more quickly when you're clear on your strategy up front. Have your investment area defined up front as well and do your due diligence as much as possible. In every area, there are great streets and not so great streets. There's loads of information that's available for free online that help can help you get to know an area, even if you can't physically visit that area at the moment. Google Maps is an amazing resource. You can check out where the nearest train station is, where the shops are, where the nearest school is, where the local employers are based. If you look on Street View, you can look at what the properties nearby look like. How well do the neighbours tend their garden? Um, what cars do they drive? What parking facilities are there? There's loads of information on there to help you get to know an area. So again, when a deal does come across your path, you can instantly recognise whether it fits your investment criteria or not. If you're less, um, less bothered about an area and looking more about return on investment, for example, do you have a process in place, though, and have some go to websites like the ONS or Crime Statistics, um, the way you can go and quickly but robustly identify whether that area fits your ideal tenant. What sort of tenants are you looking for? Practice analysing um, deals as well. Um, practice and practice, run the numbers and run the numbers. You can do this with any um, properties listed on Rightmove or Zoopla or any other portals, for example, um, and just do them as practice. You will, uh, in this way, you'll get to hone your investment spreadsheet. So you'll work out which key metrics are most important to you. And you'll also get used to um, what key metrics you want to be looking for. You want to get to the point where you can analyze a potential deal in literally minutes because you understand the area, you understand your strategy and you know how to run the numbers and you know um, what targets that you're looking for. By doing this, when you do see a deal, you will be able to pounce on it a lot quicker. You don't want to be taking hours or even days to assess a deal as when you've made your decision, it's probably already gone. So get your paperwork in order now as well. If you're working with a sourcing agent, a mortgage broker, a solicitor, they're all going to ask you for your ID, proof of address, proof of funds. If you're an existing investor, they'll probably also ask you for details of your current investments. If you're refinancing or um, you, know, you have more than three properties, you're deemed a portfolio landlord and you'll have to put a business case together for further financing. 
For anti-money laundering purposes, you'll need certified ID, and this can take a little bit of time to get together. So again, you don't want to be causing any delays once you have snapped up a deal um, in getting your paperwork ready. If you're based overseas and you're wanting to purchase through a UK limited company and using a UK bank account, then getting these set up in advance and ready to go is also really helpful. So some of these preparatory activities will take a bit of time to do and will involve some cost, but you will be getting yourself investment ready. And like I say, you'll be putting yourself ahead of the queue of other investors who maybe aren't quite so organised, so you can grab those deals when they come along. For all of these activities, you'll need help and support from various professionals. They are your power team. So if you don't yet have a power team, then this is the place to start. And I'm sure being part of the network with Haley and YFE can point you in the direction of people that can help support you. Right. For those of you who already have property investments, you may have faced challenges last year and this year around supply of labour and materials, particularly if you're doing developments and refurbishments. Although the housing and construction market has primarily been allowed to remain open throughout the pandemic, there have been knock-on effects from um, the supply chain. So for example, some factories that produce building materials had to close before um, COVID secure guidelines were created and implemented. This has caused lots of delays. I do know um, several investors whose projects have been delayed throughout the last year. You might have seen last year also that there was a huge shortage of plaster. I was in various many different WhatsApp forums and the whole um, topic of debate for quite some time was where to get plaster from and how much the cost had gone through the roof. Um, currently, the current shortage seems to be around cement um, um, and brick, um, bricks and roof tiles. So do make sure that you're aware of this. The way around this is to work with your builder and project manager. Make sure that they are planning to purchase materials in advance, um, not just turning up on the day and finding that the supplier doesn't have those materials in stock. Um, in some cases as well, I, I'm not sure um, when or if these, these shortages will be resolved. So in order to deal with that, it is worth revisiting your plans, perhaps adding in extra timescales to your plans and maybe revisiting your contingency budgets as well um, in order to take account of some of these challenges. On a more positive note, there have been changes to planning rules in recent months, which should make it easier for those people following the development strategy, particularly around commercial to residential conversions. Now, I'm not a planning expert and um, planning, planning changes and planning gain isn't my area of specialty. So this is just information that I've gleaned through uh, listening to other people and reading various industry reports. Last August, there was a change to planning rules. Um, my understanding around this is that um, that allowed um, potentially easier um, conversion or development of properties. So extensions to properties, the addition of um, additional stories to properties to uh, either enlarge an existing building or, for example, on a block of flats to add another floor to create another flat. Um, obviously, there are various conditions and criteria that you need to meet and you need to follow the, the proper planning process, um, but this could offer opportunities. And I was on a webinar this week and apparently some new changes have been announced um, just the last month in April. And this is about a new um, planning class for commercial properties. So at the moment, things like um, casinos, takeaways, salons, um, to have different classes and um, these will all be created into a new commercial class, um, just a commercial class and it will then be possible to change between different commercial classes without requesting uh, planning permission but also um, be able to change from that commercial class to residential. Um, my understanding is it's only C3 residential, which is standard residential, rather than C4, which is HMO um, residential. Again, if this is your strategy and you're looking at taking advantage of this, then seek advice from a planning specialist. But I just wanted to throw in that there are some opportunities in the market out there 
that you might want to be having a look at. Okay, I'm gonna move on to property management challenges now as this is my area of expertise and this is what I'm working with day to day. So once you have a property, you've got it refurbished and developed, you want to get some tenants in there. And this is the area that I specialize in. Um, since March last year, there has been a huge amount of changes to the legislation and regulations impacting um, renting out properties. I'm not going to go through all of those changes. Some of them have been and gone. Um, but the one, the key one that you do need to know about is the change to notice periods. So if you want to regain possession of your property, for example, because you have got a badly behaving tenant in there or they're not paying the rent, there are two main legal routes to regain possession of your property. The first one is a Section 21 notice and the other is a Section 8 notice. For those of you new to property and haven't come across this before, essentially a Section 21 notice is a request for your property back. It's as simple as that. It's a mandatory ground though, so once this notice has been issued, the tenant has to leave. If the tenant doesn't leave voluntarily, you can go to court and the court can um, give you possession of your property back. Before um, COVID, the notice period for this was two months. That has now been increased to six months. Um, Section 8 notices are a little bit more um, involved and a little bit more complex. There are many, many different grounds on which you can serve a Section 8 notice and you do have to indicate a reason from one of these grounds to issue a Section 8 notice. These grounds are split into mandatory and discretionary grounds. If you issue a notice on a mandatory ground, the court has to uphold, uphold your notice. If you issue on a discretionary ground, it's just that. The judge can use his or her discretion as to whether you should have your property back and whether the tenant needs to leave. In my experience, most people use a Section 8 notice for rent arrears. So one of the mandatory grounds is that once a tenant is two months in arrears, you can issue a Section 8 notice um, to get your property back. Pre-COVID, the notice period was two weeks. That's gradually been increased and increased throughout the pandemic with the notice period now six months. So if you've got a tenant who's not paying rent, uh, can't pay or won't pay, you're looking at at least eight months before you can actually do anything about it. So this is, is a challenge um, for uh, landlords um, in, involved in the private rented sector. So detailed referencing and vetting of tenants has always been important. And as you can see now with these extended notice periods, it's even more important um, as effectively property investors and landlords have very little legal recourse um, to dealing with problem tenants at the moment. Now, under the current rules, these uh, notice periods are due to expire at the end of May, um, but I suspect, have a sneaking suspicion that that will be extended yet again. It's been extended several times already. Um, we ourselves have a very robust vetting service anyway to make sure our rent defaults are kept low. Um, and so it, we've actually tightened up our criteria as well. We've been very fortunate throughout the pandemic in that most of our tenants um, have received furlough or continue to work as key workers. And, and at the moment, we literally have one tenant who is really struggling. Um, we're helping him to get government support, um, support from charities, um, and working with the landlord to uh, potentially look at mediation to help both parties through that. The good news is that um, housing courts are now open. They were closed for quite a period of time last year um, and that created a delay. Um, the other the glimmer of good news is that there are temporary courts being set up in public buildings. So and I've heard, um, you know, there's a local theatre close by that's being used as a court, libraries, town halls. Um, this is to help try and address some of the backlog. However, I'm also hearing reports um, that there was a backlog before COVID even hit. A friend of mine works in the court service um, on criminal and civil cases, but she said there was a backlog. Um, of cases generally anyway, um, issues in terms of availability of court space. This has only been exacerbated as a result of the courts being closed last year. 
um, the average time between claim and possession before COVID was 26 weeks. Um, I have seen reports now where even cases going to court, um, hearing dates are being set for 12 or 18 months time uh, rather than a few weeks time. So if you are in the uh, difficult position of trying to regain possession of your property, there will be lengthy court delays. And I just wanted to flag at the moment as well, um, these regulations here about pr uh, protection from eviction. These regulations are due to expire at the end of this month. Again, we'll see if they get extended again or not. But essentially what this means is that even if you go to court and get um, a possession order, which is upheld, bailiffs are prevented from actually evicting tenants, physically evicting tenants at this point. Um, so effectively, there's a bit of a moratorium on evictions at the moment. Hopefully this will change soon. So watch this space. And hopefully as um, coronavirus restrictions generally are lifted, um, then the housing court service should, re should return to some sort of normality. Um, other than a relaxation around being able to carry out right to rent checks virtually throughout the pandemic, um, all other landlord responsibilities have remained in place. So um, it has been important, for example, to make sure that you've got a valid EPC, valid gas safety certificates, electrical inspections, all of landlord responsibilities around maintenance um, and deposit protection for new tenancies, for example, has all met, um, remained in place. And the temporary relaxation of right to rent checks has now ended. So this has gone back to the um, usual responsibility whereby anybody agreeing a tenancy needs to do um, in-person, face-to-face right to rent checks with ID. Do note this really only applies in England. There are different regulations in uh, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that legislation changes in relation to um, property ownership and management um, still continued unabated last year, regardless of the coronavirus crisis. So there were various pieces of legislation that were planned to come in last year that did come in last year that increased the regulatory burden on landlords. One of those was the Homes Fitness for Human Habitation Act. Now, this is primarily aimed at addressing rogue landlords in particular. So I'm sure it doesn't apply to, to any of us who are uh, refurbishing and maintaining properties to a really high standard. Unfortunately, there are some rogue landlords out there that give the industry a bad name. Um, prior to this act, if tenants had an issue with their landlords not maintaining the property adequately, um, their only redress was to complain to the council and the council had to take action. Unfortunately, some councils were not as proactive as others and some tenants were left with properties uh, unsuitable for their habitation. Under this act, the tenants can now take direct legal redress against their landlords. Um, last year, there was a new regulation that came into force around EPCs. Um, this is worth bearing in mind if you're purchasing property, refurbishing and developing property. Um, as from last year, all private rented properties need to be graded E or above on their EPC in order to be rented out. There are some exemptions to this, for example, um, particularly old style buildings um, or potential issues um, in different buildings. These do need to be registered and an exemption sought. What's more interesting is that the government over Christmas just gone launched another consultation around um, increasing EPC ratings going forward as part of their environmental policy. They are looking at making um, all private rented properties having to be graded grade C or above on private rented properties from 2025 onwards. Now, that's not that far away. Um, and if you, you know, have got an old terraced house, for example, that's barely scraping by as an E, um, then you do need to be factoring in now how you can make um, environmental improvements to that property in order to meet the um, new requirements, which are more than likely to come in. So this is one of those government consultations that isn't really a consultation. It's like this is what's happening in a few years time. On a plus note, though, um, the government 
did launch something called the Green Homes Grant during the pandemic. This was only available for a few months, but did offer grants to both homeowners and landlords to um, do environmental improvements to their properties. We were uh, successful in helping one of our clients apply for one of these grants. Um, which covered the cost of some improvements to one of his properties. So that was a benefit. These, this grant has now closed, um, but they do come and go from time to time. So it is really worth keeping your eyes open. And given the amount of work that might need to be done to particularly older stock of property going forwards, it's very likely that some sort of government grant to help cover the cost of improvements will be coming back in future. So do keep your eyes open. There were a couple of tax changes last year. These um, relate primarily to people holding properties in their own personal name, so I won't go into too much detail on that. Um, the Tenant Fee Act came into full force last year, which essentially means that landlords and agents can't charge tenants any costs in relation to their tenancy. So, for example, you can't um, offset the cost of referencing back to the tenant. That now has to be borne by the landlord. And the final piece of legislation was around electrical um, inspection reports. This now applies to single lets as well as HMOs and requires all private rented properties to have an electrical inspection report carried out at intervals of no less than five years or at the frequency by uh, determined by your electrician. So I just wanted to point out here that um, legislation is conti has continued and will continue. There is something in the pipeline called the Renters Reform Bill. This has been around since around 2019. Um, it has been delayed last year, primarily as a result of COVID and Brexit, but it is likely to come back uh, on the scene as uh, both of those issues hopefully calm down in the year ahead. Essentially, the key plank of this reform bill is to abolish Section 21 notices. This is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, this is a tool landlords have at the moment that they can use to regain possession of their property. Section 21 notices have already been abolished in Scotland. This happened several years ago, so there is a precedent for it um, and uh, some experience in Scotland to, to base the reform bill on. It, this will essentially end assured shorthold tenancies. Tenancies will become um, assured tenancies instead. On a plus point, though, um, they are looking to reform possession rights through the courts. So to give landlords uh, a slicker process and a quicker process to regain possession of their property should they need to um, if the tenant defaults on um, their, their contract in any way. Um, there is also the concept of lifetime deposits. This will probably go out to consultation. Um, again, I wouldn't worry too much about this at this point. I'm just flagging to you that um, the train of legislation does not stop regardless of what else is going on um, in terms of pandemic or Brexit. And um, one of the changes that I just thought was interesting to draw your attention to um, is the change in ten tenant demographics that I've seen in the last few months. Um, prior to Christmas, um, our uh, for HMOs, our typical tenant coming to us was from Eastern Europe. They were migrant workers coming to the UK looking for work. They would come over speculatively, stay with friends or family, and then apply for a job at big employers such as Amazon, The Hook Group or Hermes, which are all big employers in the area where I'm based. And essentially, if they turned up for an interview, they basically got the job. Um, so it was very easy for them to come over to work. Um, as a result of Brexit, many of my clients were worried that this stream of type of tenants would simply fall off a cliff and simply stop. The rules around Brexit mean that um, people from the EU no longer have this freedom of movement to come to the UK to live and work. And indeed, we have seen those um, types of tenants and that demographic of tenants has, has pretty much dried up. However, the number of applications for our HMO rooms has not changed. And in fact, we're busier than ever. What we're seeing instead is an influx of people from Commonwealth countries and countries that have had historic ties with Britain. 
We're seeing lots of applications from people from India and Ghana in particular coming to work as nurses in the NHS. They're coming over on either permanent or three year fixed term contracts. So these are uh, more highly skilled workers and they have um, longer and more secure employment lined up when they arrive. I'm also seeing uh, people coming over from Hong Kong. So you might have seen the changes um, to the types of passport that Hong Kong people are allowed to come to the UK. We have um, helped several families uh, move, relocate from Hong Kong over to the UK as a result of those changes which were introduced in January of this year. Um, interestingly, I am dealing with applications from South Africa, Japan, uh, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, it's certainly keeping things interesting. I'm getting used to dealing with biometric residence cards rather than EU passports and also um, with utilising the free Home Office Right to Rent service. So um, I'm going to start to draw to a, um, a close here. I just wanted to say that in conclusion, there are challenges in the marketplace right now, but that doesn't mean that there aren't deals out there. There is always deals to be found. Don't forget the fundamentals never change. The fundamentals of supply and demand um, uh, don't, don't change, but also the fundamentals of property investing and property management. It's all about doing your due diligence, knowing your strategy, knowing your area, and be clear on your risk factors and how to mitigate those. Have the power team around you so that you are aware of the challenges that we've talked about here and how to address them. My final point, I suppose, is that um, location is really important as well. So this becomes part of your due diligence. Let's take a really simple example. Let's say you wanted to invest in student accommodation. There's no point buying a little quaint property in a village which is miles away from the university with little or no public transport. Um, so just bear that example in mind when you're looking at doing your properties. The same is true for HMOs. Um, certainly um, in the past, I have seen people buy a HMO, a property and turn it into a HMO in a location that just wasn't suitable. They really hadn't done enough due diligence on the area. The property was too far away from transport links, too far away from major employment centres, too far away from shops uh, and leisure facilities. They had done a beautiful job and it was a fantastic property, um, but it was just in the wrong area and they just weren't attracting the sorts of tenants that they thought they would be attracting. So the TV programme isn't called Location, Location, Location for nothing. Um, do bear that in mind. And again, you've got a great support team around you to help you um, analyse your deals uh, and make sure that your uh, in any deals that come across your desk do meet your investment strategies. So um, I'm going to draw to a close there, I think, and hand back to Hayley. Hopefully I haven't gone too much over. I've no idea of time. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Fantastic. Um, again, like I said, uh, I've taken loads of notes as usual. Um, we have got some questions in the question box, so if you can stick around for a few minutes. Um, and also, um, uh, you know, I, I have a few questions for you as well, if that's OK with you. <laughs> um, so um, we'll go through the questions in the chat box first of all. So, of course, you know, from my market update and then from the feedback that you're giving in terms of your opinion on the current marketplace and uh, how long things are taken, et cetera, um, it, everything does have a bit of a backlog, doesn't it? Um, and I'm most certainly seeing that with projects that I'm working on, the properties that I'm going through purchase phase with, and it, 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 it is terribly frustrating, but it's just as a result of so much um, uh, demand and not enough people to actually push those through. <laughs> um, so um, we are seeing a lot of that across the board, I would say, not just in conveyancing or, 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 or anything like that, or lending and actually acquiring the property straight through from renovations um, and, uh, and getting the property fit for purpose. So we've got a question here um, in the chat box about um, in terms of flipping a property now and the time from offer to completion and sale, so we're fully exercising that deal and realizing your profit what's the um increase um uh time frame i, I mean i could answer this but <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't I haven't done a, I haven't done um flips for quite a long time so I'm probably you're probably close to this okay to 
I'll, I'll answer that one then. Um, so, um, I mean, in terms of actually from offer to completion, of course, that's taken a lot longer time for you to actually own the property before you can get through the door and start doing, you know, what you propose to do in order to get that property back to the market. Um, so we are looking, as you said, you know, you're looking at around 16 to 18 weeks. We're finding around four to five months to initially purchase the property, which is, you know, slightly longer than normal. We've always said, uh, you know, especially for our internationals, allow three months. It may you may get it through within six to eight weeks, but if you allow three months, um, and uh, uh, you'll be there or thereabouts. But it is taking longer and longer. So to initially acquire that property, you are looking at around four months. In my in well, in my experience anyway. Um, even with cash, it's still taking that that uh, that that amount of time. So it's not just lending that's holding this up. It's the sheer demand and uh, just not enough uh, time in the world for the <laughs> poor conveyance and solicitors that are trying to push these through. Also, they're waiting on uh, you know information from various different parts, um, and everything isn't back up and running as it really should be. Um, so that coupled obviously with the, the increase in demand is just putting more and more pressure on that sector. So acquiring the property is taking a lot longer. We're looking at around uh, four months there. But then actually to do a renovation on the property also is taking longer because of the backlog, lack of supply um, and uh, getting, you know, good builders that are actually available is at this moment in time, uh, again, more and more uh, difficult. Um, so you know on average you're looking at if you're doing quite a sizable renovation you know uh, upgrading the kitchen the bathroom maybe the electrics gas central heating etc um uh, redecoration throughout so internal decoration nothing really structural you're still looking at around uh, eight, eight to twelve weeks there i would say uh, at this moment in time whereas that may have been around four to six weeks um you know pre pre-pandemic um but because of the backlog, it is taking longer. So I would say if you're calculating now, so in normal uh, terms, we would say allow eight months for a flip to purchase the property, do it up, get it to the market and get it sold. Um, I would definitely say, and that's creating buffer. Um, I would say that's more realistic time frame in this market at this moment in time. And I would calculate holding any lending or anything over at least 12 months. Um, that is definitely my opinion. Um, just because of the sheer delays across the whole of uh, the sector. It's a great question, by the way. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that name. <laughs> Sharon's much better at pronunciation than me. <laughs> so, um, so we actually, there's another question there from uh, Kelly Shaw, more of a statement on uh, the amount of um, uh, the increase in actually renovation costs as a result of again, um, uh, the, the demand. When demand is high, we name our, you know, uh, the industry can name their price and that's very much what's happening, um, you know. Um, so that's what we are seeing. Um, uh, so yes, renovation costs have gone up, um, uh, renovation times have uh, are taken longer. Uh, everything is just that little bit more expensive and taking that little bit extra time. So as professionals, we can factor all that in up front. We can make sure that we're getting quotes, et cetera, prior to moving forward. Um, and we can build in buffer, putting ex contingencies in place, allowing that extra time um, in case there are further delays uh, that we haven't anticipated. And in, in case there are you know, further costs that, that arise throughout that process. Um, so all we can do is create buffer and, and, and we know that this is going to be the case. We know what we're stepping into. We're not walking into a deal with our eyes closed. We're fully aware of what the case is. Um, and you've got to obviously be prepared to take that that step or not. If it's not for you, wait. <laughs> if it is, for, um, personally, I wouldn't wait. I'd rather just take it, let it take a little bit longer and minimize my risk my end and control what I can control. And that's all we can do. Absolutely, absolutely. I think, and and yeah, I just uh, would just chip chip in there. I'm like, I I didn't want to be, I don't um want to be um too down on challenges. I guess what I would say is, yes, it's a challenging market, but if you uh, can get in and get involved in this market, then when things get easier and get better, because they will, and things always change, yeah. um, and you'll be absolutely flying. And you know, uh, you've got to you've got to earn your battle scars in. 
property investing and property management um so just get stuck in and get cracking <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean you know this is what i say all the time and you've hit the nail on the head sharon in order to call yourself an investor you have to be investing <laughs> so you know um it, it, if yes it, it is a challenging market but markets like this is where you build character and where you get that experience and where like you say you get your battle scars you understand how to work with your teams it is more challenging and you just benefit as a result of going through that process absolutely so uh, we've got another question here as property management company are you managing serviced accommodation no, we don't do service accommodation. So service accommodation, although it is in the property family, it is actually, uh, it is quite different. So it's more tourism and hospitality and the tax implications around it are quite different as well. Yeah, so it is, yeah. yeah. So residential. Um, you, you should definitely get into that, Sharon, <laughs> because the uptake this year, I, I, uh, I you know, it's been, it's been uh, obviously a popular um, or a more popular strategy over the last, probably four or five years now um but uh uh you know although it's been a sector that's been very hard hit as a result of uh of, of the pandemic um the next uh, 18 months in my opinion that market is going to boom um, and we're already seeing it you know it's it's ridiculous um any of you pop on to airbnb or booking.com and try and book somewhere here in the uk at this moment in time especially if it's uh you know a seaside resort or a, a tourist uh tourist place you know, it, it, it's ridiculous it, and, and we're seeing bookings just across the borders it's, it's really quite exciting <laughs> so I, I love that strategy um, but um, uh, so yes if you are interested in service accommodation you do need a specialist management company because it is a serviced industry there's guest relations things like that obviously managing your diaries your online um uh presence as well making sure that calendars are booked out and all of that management in the back end is done properly through your channel manager etc um because it, it is a, a lot lot different and of course management fees are much higher as well um as a result of that because there's more work to be done um and uh in terms of occupancy levels of course it depends uh, that's something that you have to check out prior to moving into that type of industry you have to qualify why people would be traveling to that area for short-term stays and what's driving that type of um uh, individual to that area and so you need to do all of that as part of your due diligence. You can check out loads of different websites out there that you can check out, um, but you can start with Visit Britain, um, uh, Visit England as well. They've got loads of different variations, Visit Wales and everything like that. Uh, they will have visitor statistics. They will have inbound, of course, naturally the statistics on that side is going to be uh, low um, or next to nothing as of the whole of the industry being locked down last year. So ignore that, but you can look at trends um throughout i think it goes back to 2009 i think um so you can look at visitor statistics how many people are visiting are they rising year on year what are they visiting that area for it will actually even break it down for you in terms of are they visiting friends and family is it recreation are they students are they are they business travelers um are they inbound or are they domestic so it's very very detailed site you could get lost in there i can spend hours on there and, and still have more to find out so um don't get analyst polaris it's a whoop yes that's what i'm trying to say um but you do need to obviously understand the industry that you're stepping into you can't just do service accommodation anywhere in my opinion not be and and, and be confident with your occupancy level Again, if you are doing serviced accommodation, make sure you stress test at 50% occupancy. You want to break even at that point. And then remember that you're going to have other costs involved as well, such as linen, guest welcome packs, card fees, things like that. Okay. And management, which is a big cost. And cleaning, another very big cost. <laughs> so just remember all of that. And so in terms of rent to rent, do you actually have many people approach you for rent to rent adopting either serviced accommodation or 
um, uh, multi-letter HMO strategy? Interesting. Interestingly, not actually. I mean, um, we have been quite well established in the industry for a while, so I guess people know what we do now. So people coming to us are asking for help managing uh, refurbished HMOs primarily. Mm -hmm. um, I do know quite a few people doing rent to rent quite successfully, um, more as a rent to rent HMO strategy. Yeah. Um, the, um, there are some people I know are doing rent to rent service accommodation, but again, it needs to be in the right location. Yeah. So in more touristy places like Chester, for example, you've got to do it in the right location. Yeah, yeah, Chester's a great place to do service accommodation. But yes, I mean, I think the reason is, is a lot of people will stay away from the agents uh, because they're scared to ask you the question. <laughs> Do you have any landlords that would be, you know, that would be happy to move forward with this type of contract? Um, so a lot of people won't ask the the, uh, the lessons agents, as the management companies, as a result of thinking that they'll get a no. And quite often they will, because you get more no's, of course, because um, just because of the, that, that's just the name of the game, basically. Uh, but don't be scared to ask lettings agencies and management companies about rent to rent because it is a growing uh, strategy. More and more people are doing it, especially with Section 24, buy to let tax, and things like that. We can adopt now creative strategies with landlords that fall into that bracket, and actually, um, uh, it creates a, a very good win win situation. So, um, have the conversation you know Sharon's not scary she's just said she doesn't cover it at this moment in time but knows lots of people that do she's still a great person to speak to <laughs> so yeah brilliant okay um so um any more questions on here I can't see any more questions coming through just what you were um saying about the eviction process um uh, so we're actually going through and <clears throat> with the courts and the backlog and now being able to obviously get our court dates i've had a case going through that was actually a rent arrears pre-covid so that it's not a can't pay it's a won't pay unfortunately um and um it's very frustrating as a landlord of course as we all know um but this is this is uh, an ongoing case um and because the rent arrears are so substantial, of course, we were able to go um, uh, uh, forward um, and go for eviction. So we've got, uh, we've had a court date uh, three times now, which is great. Um, but every single time, the morning of that court date, um, we've had a telephone call to say that there's no judge available to hear our case. Um, and that is what I'm hearing a lot of. Um, so getting the court date is one thing. Waiting for that was frustrating in itself. Um, uh, but then getting the court date and having three times now already um, uh, a call on the morning of that hearing and saying that there's no one available is massively frustrating. Luckily, I, I don't, ha you know, I have a couple of cases. Um, uh, so, it, and uh, you know, for the size of my portfolio, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, so I'm not complaining, but I can see um, it, uh, that it is very, very frustrating. And again, pure backlog. It's, it's once we get the court date, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have a judge available to hear at that <laughs> case, which is, you know, terribly frustrating. And so they do need to do something about that because, of course, you've got all of these, you know, um, uh, a satellite um, uh, um, court set up and that to obviously push more cases through. But if you don't have the judges available to hear those cases, it's pointless. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see. Hopefully something will be done about that. Um, What's your thoughts on rent guarantee insurance? Do you actually, um, so where I take out rent guarantee insurance and more so now than ever before, yes, the price has gone up as a result of COVID, but it's a cost of business as far as I'm concerned and a cost you pay for a surety. Um, uh, so we actually do that as practice. Do, do you look at that type of thing or have many requests for that type of um, protection? We, we we do and and I think interestingly the pandemic has brought that into sharper focus mm -hmm. for us. So historically I personally haven't really bothered with rent protection insurance. We have a very robust vetting process anyway and I do all of the referencing in-house 
um, just because every now and again I go and try a different referencing agency and they don't quite meet my standards <laughs> so I do it all myself and we we've, we've had very very few like you can count on one hand how many issues we've had over the last 20 years so um, I'm quite happy in terms of to effectively like underwrite my own risk on that mm -hmm. however as a result of the pandemic it was something that we did consider um, and before sort of like maybe even just before the pandemic I think we were just we were just coming out of dealing with uh, an eviction for one of our clients actually so it wasn't one of our properties um, and th at that point this was pre-pandemic we were still we were seeing court delays there as well then mm. I'm like mm, okay this is this is a little bit worrying we can see the writing on the wall so the very next um, single let that I did of my own property I actually like right okay I think now the time is right for me to to start putting in place rent protection insurance mm -hmm. so I have been doing that as as a matter of um, practice for me um, for my my own portfolio mm -hmm. so my own portfolio now is covered with rent protection insurance mm -hmm. um, interestingly during the pandemic rent protection insurance was suspended for a while yeah. so a lot of people actually exited the market or suspended just because of the uncertainty as you say prices have gone up and um, the length of time of uh, cover was also reduced for a period as well although that's now been extended my brokers effectively gone back to where they were yeah. although the price is, is slightly higher for me um i i really i do regular like um risk analysis or spot analysis of my portfolio every year and for me it was uh, it's a no brainer that i want rent protection insurance when you're looking at uh, i mean even pre pandemic you're looking 6 7 8 months um, to get your property back now it's like how long is a piece of string yeah. uh, it's more, more like 18 months now isn't it really yeah, exactly um having said that you know we did we did then actually have a campaign where we actually spoke to all of our clients individually last year we explained to them the risks the changes in legislation and we offered them all rent protection insurance interestingly most of those people turned us down yeah. uh, they felt that the, that the cost of the insurance wasn't wasn't worth it. Having said that, they hadn't actually experienced any voids or any evictions at that point. Yeah. Um, and you know, we we are we are really good. As I say, we literally have one tenant out of our whole portfolio at the moment that's causing us difficulties. So I guess we were a victim of our own success um, for our clients. But I certainly do have rent protect insurance on my portfolio. Yeah. Good. So do I. And, I, I, you know, it's a bit of business decision, isn't it? You can make it. There's no right or wrong way. Um, we don't have to insure ourselves or, or anything. We, we do um, uh, because that's the choice that we make. We would rather have that assurity. Um, so count three years in France to get your property. Yeah, I've, I have quite a few people in France that um, I've mentored that are investing here in the UK and it's very strict. Very, very strict. Right. OK, I think that's all the questions. That was a great. I could talk to you all day, Sharon. So I, I better let the guys go and um, let you guys go as well. Um, but um, thank you ever so much for your time this morning. Really, really interesting session. And it was great to hear your thoughts as well, always. Um, so um, I'm going to say goodbye to you and I'll just jump on and do a few updates in terms of what we've got up next and the next date. Um, and then I'm going to say goodbye to these guys as well. So everybody say thank you to Sharon. Thank you very much. <laughs> See you again soon. Take care. Bye. Right. So um, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. I'm sure you will agree that Sharon is awesome. I could speak to her all day. I never get bored. Um, so now I'm going to jump on to uh, just a few market updates and then I'll love you and leave you for today. Um, so um, what's going on with YFE? So you can register for our free um, Freedom Blueprint. Um, so you can visit the website that's on the screen there um, or the link that's on the screen there, sorry. Um, or you can actually visit our website at www.yourfreedomempire.co.uk. Um, and if you click on the educational hub on the options menu, you'll be able to um, uh, link into that, that webinar there. Also, um, our property success convention, the next date is the 12th and 13th of June. That is a Saturday and a Sunday. It's 8 a.m. till uh, 12 
um, noon uh, UK time. Um, it is an awesome session. We do market updates there. We have power teams in. We talk about lending. Um, we look at different strategies. It's very, very good session for those of you that are looking to invest here in the UK property market or may already have some training or a portfolio and looking to really drive your business to the next steps. Um, integrate and mix with uh, uh, mentors, uh, speakers, and also uh, good positive people in the room as well. So if you're interested, you can again visit our website, all that link that's on the screen in the Education Hub, and you can get signed up for that next event. If you know anybody that wants to get into UK property, of course, they can join as well. Um, so bring your friends along. It's an awesome uh, two days, and we've had excellent feedback. We do keep the numbers to around 20. Um, uh, we don't like to go any higher than that. Um, so if you are interested, get registered as soon as possible because otherwise you will have to wait for the next date. And then, of course, we're still doing these uh, consultation calls. Uh, they go very well. I had one yesterday. Um, uh, and um, this is very much a three 30-minute call with either myself or one of the mentors you can again book this through the link um, or you can actually book it through the option menu on the Education Hub on our website. Um, and uh, that will be a 30 minute call with a mentor uh, that can talk about your specific situation. Maybe you've had some training, purchased some properties, you're stuck or you've lost momentum or you're struggling right now and you really want somebody that's active in the industry to just give their opinion um, uh, or someone to bounce off. Uh, book that call in if you want that um, and you can do that through the website and again we like to make sure that we're covering sessions and we are doing this now um, once a month um, so we like to make sure that we're covering sessions and topics that are useful to you in your investment journey so if you have any ideas about what you would like us to cover or anything that you would like to know a little bit more about um, or you have any questions that you'd like us to answer um, you can pop an email across to admin at yourfreedomempire.co.uk pop in their webinar questions or web or topic um, and uh, give us your feedback and questions on there and we'll make sure we cover it off for you this is very much for you guys and that's pretty much it it's Friday which I would normally say it means pizza but I've put so much weight on over the pandemic I actually not having pizza tonight which is <laughs> not good at all um, but I'll still have a really nice time family night with my um, uh, gorgeous son and husband um, we're we're going to be playing pool tonight because we've had a new pool table and um, so I'm going to love you and leave you it's been great to see you all thank you all for joining us again I will see you all again next month and next uh, month's date is the 4th of June, 9 a.m. UK time. Uh, again, uh, uh, invite as many people as you want. Numbers are growing and growing. We absolutely love it. Uh, but guys, have an awesome Friday. Have an excellent weekend. And I will see you again next month. Goodbye for now.